It's been a while since I've done a noobs guide series and today's video will cover a noobs guide to suspension. If you're interested in this series, I'm going to link a playlist to this in the description as well as at the end of this video. For the most part, we're going to separate things into non-adjustable suspension, adjustable suspension. For non-adjustable suspension, we have the one that literally everyone has heard of, which are lowering springs. Now I'm going to say it right now, lowering springs are mostly for looks. The main benefit is they reduce the center of gravity of your car. So yes, that does help with getting some performance. You're going to have less score want less bogging and then you're also going to have not as much body roll. Now they usually result in a rather harsh ride. At best they'll have, they'll just match your stock ride because obviously they're using your stock struts or shocks and they're just changing the springs only. Now when it comes to buying lowering springs, words you'll hear thrown around will be linear or progressive and basically in a nutshell, a linear spring rate means it's going to be a fixed and very predictable. So if you were to suddenly accelerate, suddenly break or do all of those things, the springs are designed with mind of having a linear system to them and how they handle those situations. Progressive is going to be more expensive because it's going to have a more reactive way for how it performs. For example, if your car suddenly accelerates, it's going to stiffen up to reduce squat. If you suddenly brake, it's going to stiffen up to reduce bogging. Now, this is good because when you're not suddenly accelerating or suddenly braking and you're just punching it around town, progressive systems are actually rather soft and they don't actually become stiff until they react to a certain type of set movement. Linear springs do not have this, so it should be rather obvious that they're going to be the more uncomfortable of the two, but they are also the cheaper of the two. Now, the advantages of lowering springs is that they're extremely cheap. They're going to be the cheapest way to lower your car, aside from straight up cutting your stock springs. The disadvantage is that they will have a worse ride than stock, and even the best lowering springs ever made in existence can only give you the same ride as stock, because again, they're not actually changing your strut assembly. They're still using your OEM struts. Research what you're buying for your car because someone else who runs a 1.2 inch strut may work for their vehicle because they stayed on the stock 19s but if you upsize to the 20s you may only be able to do a half inch drop otherwise you're going to start rubbing your fenders the final disadvantage of lowering springs is that they do wear out your factory struts or strocks faster that's just the reality of having a harsher ride than oem now if you have a new car that shouldn't be a big deal if you have a used car you should probably think about coilovers instead we won't cover that until we get to the adjustable section the next non-adjustable suspension item we'll talk about are drop spindles. Now, just like lowering springs, these are a flat fixed drop and they are not adjustable. Unlike lowering springs, this changes the entire spindle assembly. They are really, really expensive and they're really only for cars that have leaf springs and people who don't have a normal strut assembly, modern strut assembly, I should say, basically cars that have old truck technology. If you have a modern strut assembly, you should just avoid this route entirely. It's easier for you guys to just drop via lowering springs or even coilovers would be cheaper. Now the whole point of drop spindles is usually to preserve the OEM ride quality. Aftermarket drop spindles will usually have the exact same geometry as OEM drop spindles. The advantages they will have is they're going to be made of better material which makes them stronger and lighter weight. The only difference they usually will have is that their shaft mounting point is going to be at a higher position to make the car have a lower ride height. So basically the way your hub mounts is like more inwards to your fender or upwards to your fender I should say which actually reduces the overall position of your vehicle. The inverse is true as well. If you're trying to use these to lift a car, you can get one that has a lower position. Now, the advantages of drop spindles is they maintain a stock ride quality. This is really good for cars that have extremely decent leaf spring or extremely good leaf spring and Magnarite systems like Corvettes. Now, the disadvantages is obviously it's not adjustable and it's extremely expensive and it's really, again, only recommended, in my opinion, for Corvettes or for performance lower trucks. If you're building us over ring truck or a NASCAR style lower truck, this could make sense. Otherwise, for any car that doesn't have leaf springs, I would recommend you guys go lowering springs or even better, coils, because even that is cheaper. Moving on to adjustable suspension, we're going to mention coilovers first and foremost because everyone talks about it and I can't resist talking about it, so it's easier if I just introduce you to them earlier. Coilovers are hands down the best budget option for anyone who isn't on leaf springs or old 60-year-old truck technology. If you have a modern suspension setup, you do have the option to switch over to coilovers. This is the easiest way to achieve 
achieve both an adjustable ride height as well as adjustable stiffness. The whole point of a coil over is that you can change your mind about what you set it to. That is true of both height and stiffness. For this video, we'll talk about the one that does both height and stiffness. Like I said, you guys really should be able to afford the ones that are both height and dampening. It's actually not that expensive for most vehicles. Like for a Mustang, you could get a good one for $700 to $1,000. When you go to adjust them, you can just use a spanner and a lot of coilovers will actually give you a spanner that's specifically made for the diameter of the coilover so you can put it right there and just spin this way, spin that way and set it to whatever setting you want. Now, a thing to keep in mind is that if you intend to slam a car on coilovers, you do need aftermarket camber and caster plates Coilovers are surprisingly affordable. I would call them the mid-range option for this video. They're neither expensive nor cheap. They are something you have to think about in their long-term investment. They are easier to install than springs, however, because instead of removing the spring from the strut, you just replace the entire strut assembly. And finally, they're extremely compatible with most other aftermarket setups, which makes them the most ideal use for performance driving scenarios, be it autocross, toge, track, or even just street warrior. The disadvantages of coilovers are really nothing, it's straight up nothing. This is what I refer to as the baseline suspension mod, because anything else will either have an advantage over coils, but at a cost of having a disadvantage. Coilovers are literally just a middle of the pack option for suspension, which is why they're the safest option, because they give you anything and everything you want. I guess one disadvantage is that they don't adjust on the fly. You do have to park your car, physically get outside of your vehicle, open your trunk, and then open your hood, and then dial them down by hand or with key, again, depending on what you bought. Another adjustable suspension setup are hydraulics. Based on its name, you can imagine it uses some kind of liquid, hence the word hydro or hydro in this case. In this specific instance, it does use oil to help lift the car up and down and pressurize it. It needs a compressor, an actuator, and a reservoir, so this isn't something you can buy as a standalone system. It does need a lot of supporting mods to be paired with it. Hydraulics can create a firmer ride than stock, but blah 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 blah. Look, look let's be real. The real reason you want hydraulics are for one of two reasons: to quickly raise and lift a car over obstacles, for example, front end lifts like the one on the C8 Corvette, Ford GT's whole car lift, or the Lamborghini Huracan's front end lift. Or the second reason you want hydraulics is to just straight up style on fools at your local meet and just start dancing your automobile. This is going to be by and far the only suspension system that has the largest range of travel when it comes to lifting and lowering a vehicle. Now onto the advantages and disadvantages. The advantages is that it has the fastest reaction time to adjusting ride heights of any suspension. It's extremely fast, I should say. Its second advantage is it has the longest length of travel for any other suspension, again, in regards to ride height. The final advantage is that they're stiff enough to handle constant dancing, constant stress, constant essentially beating down on them, including track usage as well. So this is an adjustable suspension setup you can actually use on track. Now the disadvantage should be rather obvious. This is an extremely expensive system to install. Some of my friends, like I actually have someone who's trying to do a Lincoln Town Car low rider build, he's going to be spending upwards of 7 thousand dollars to really get it to where it needs to go and you also need supporting wheels to handle it and you need a lot of a lot that's an understatement you need a lot of supporting mods to get it to work the way you want another disadvantage is that this has a lot of maintenance hydraulics obviously because of how many supporting mods they have those are many different points of failure and the final disadvantage is that you do give up trunk space for it be it front trunk space or rear trunk space and you or really in general you if it isn't a trunk space if you manage to outfit this somewhere in the wheel well you give up some space i even see people start doing rear seat deletes for the more intense ones that are designed to dance the vehicle all over. The next adjustable suspension, we're going to talk about air suspension. So air suspension is adjustable ride height on the go. And these are the ones you'll hear go tss, tss, tss and has all the air hissing noises and they like to roll in meats like they're the coolest people around because I'm not gonna lie they are pretty cool actually. It does adjust stiffness to some extent but a lot of them mostly are for ride height only. They're a lot more affordable when it comes to adjusting a car on the fly. So unlike a coilover you do not need to park your car first, open its hood, open its trunk and dial down your coils. In this case you can literally stay seated and push the button even while you're moving. So if you encounter a speed bump you can lift the car up and then once you pass it you can hiss it back down and it's really really neat for people who have really bad driveways but you really want the bagged or the slammed look and you don't want to pay the extreme upfront cost of hydraulics air suspension is your best bet now the main advantage of air suspension is that it's actually a smooth and comfortable ride which is a very nice bonus because that's not the biggest reason people would buy it the initial design of air suspension was originally for 18 wheeler trucks and that was the intended purpose was to give them a smooth comfortable ride the other advantage is that it can adjust ride height on the fly and it does it fairly 
fairly quickly. It's not quite as fast as hydraulics where you can literally see cars like the 4 GT just go up and down. In order to do the same amount of travel, about four or so inches, you're gonna see air suspension do take some time, but it only takes 30 seconds. It's still much faster than getting out of your vehicle and dialing your coilovers. Another advantage is that it's actually surprisingly affordable. Air suspension has been around for several decades now. Like I said, its application was mostly used on commercial vehicles. So it's been something that's been engineered to death and made very, very efficient for consumer use at this point. Now onto disadvantages, air suspension is not as stiff or as firm as other suspension systems. Yes, you can race these on track. Yes, you can buy cups for them. Yes, you can even get lucky and never have yours blow out. But here's the reality of the situation. Even if you have the best bag system in the world, that they do fail on track. And when they do, it's extremely expensive. If you're better off just tracking on coils, just track on coils. I, I physically can't stop them. I really cannot tell you not to do this. But again, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And that's a really quick way to lose all your money really quickly is because of your stubbornness. Just Another disadvantage of bags is they have a lot of maintenance and you do have to constantly deal with the upkeep. It's not that hard. You just watch the humidity levels and you make sure you check the bag systems and everything and just make sure air suspension is doing all fine and dandy. Another disadvantage is similar to hydraulics, these do require a decent amount of aftermarket accessories and supporting mods in order to even install it. It's not as much as hydraulics, you usually just need to have a big tank to store the air, then you need a compressor to make the air move around and so on and so forth. And similar to hydraulics, you will be giving up some trunk space for it, albeit not as much as hydraulics. Basically what I'm trying to say is this is basically a discount version of what hydraulics perform as. Another form of adjustable suspension are lowering bolts. Now these come pre-installed on most sports cars with leaf springs. Again, Corvettes, who am I kidding? That's kind of like the only sports car in the world that still is on leaf springs. A lot of trucks will also already have stock lowering bolts. Now the stock ones can be dialed in and out and around and you can lower a car even on a stock one. So if you didn't know that, if you own a C6 or C7 Corvette, you can actually just turn your lo your lowering bolts and your stock ones, you can usually lose about it one inch to one and a half inch on them. So if you ever thought about lowering your Corvette and you're like, oh wow, Wow, switching over to coilovers is so expensive. Oh wow, drop spindles are so expensive. Oh, I can't use lowering springs. Just turn down your lowering bolts all the way and just see if that's good enough for you. It's extremely easy. You don't even have to remove your wheels. You just jack the car up and you turn them. If the stock ones don't turn enough for you, that's where aftermarket ones come into play. Now, the problem is with aftermarket ones, you will be spending lowering spring money. So around $130 to $300 for a good one. Yes, you can find cheap ones off eBay that are $68 dollars but they're gonna start to squeak or they'll even snap and that's not something you want to deal with if you have a z07 package z06 so a c7 z06 z07 wow that's a mouthful these don't do anything ask me how i know i later read a forum where people said the z07 packages do not lower with lowering bolts and if they do they ride terribly and i can confirm it ride it rode horrible but for the z07 packages you guys will have to buy drop spindles if you want adjustable systems you may even have to uh, well, well, swapping the coils is really expensive, so, um, yeah, getting on bags isn't an option because you have to basically replace your entire leaf spring assembly because obviously most bag systems are designed for coil slash strut designs. You're basically pushed in a corner. That's kind of where I am at right now. I'm just going to go drop spindles and deal with the flat drop that it gives me. Just live that static life, you know? Onto the final suspension in this video, it's going to be magnetic suspension. This is straight up oppressive. And you're probably about to say, hey bladed, don't you mean impressive? No, 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 I know what I said and you heard me correctly. I meant oppressive because the existence of magnetic suspension is literally oppressive due to how ridiculously superior, I'm gonna say that, they're extremely superior to every other form of suspension that's on the market right now. This is the future of suspension in the same way that even trains are becoming magnetic and blah, 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 blah. So even with my dual wishbone leaf spring setup, which is like 60 year old truck technology, but to be fair, it's been optimized absolutely to the maximum where Chevy Lily did everything they could with it before they finally to give up on it for the CA and go on coils. This system, MagnaRide, when paired with old technology, makes it feel better than new. I have friends who have coilover European cars who still ride worse than my Leaf Spring MagnaRide car. Not because Leaf Springs are praiseworthy, but because MagnaRide is praiseworthy. So you can only imagine what happens when you combine MagnaRide with coilovers. If you have the ability to option these from factory, please take that option if you intend on doing any kind of performance driving, even if you just do a lot of aggressive street driving or if you do toges or stuff like that, I would still recommend buying these just because it changes your world. You can literally adjust stiffness on the fly, making it 
ridiculously oppressive. Not impressive, like I said, oppressive due to how much they change the meta of expectations of suspension. The advantages of Magnaride is that it is the best ride quality to ever exist. Their systems are so advanced that they can actually scan the ground tens of thousands of times adjusting whatever they need to over every single pebble, bump, whatever. When I drive my Corvette, I don't feel a single thing in the road. It's extremely, extremely reactive. It always knows what to do. It is also stronger and lighter than most other suspension systems that deal with stuff like this. Magnaride may sound like it's super high-tech, super futuristic stuff because it's called magnetic suspension. Ooh, wow, you know, dang. It's not as complicated as you think. It's basically a tube that's filled with magnetic fluid and then you have a series of magnets that follow that fluid. Like, depending on what setting you set the vehicle to, it's going to have certain preferences, obviously. In touring mode, it's going to try to favor more soft settings and never max itself out to the stiffest one. In sport mode, it'll try balance. In track mode, it's going to try more of the stiff. Disadvantages. You must give up your firstborn son to afford it. Magnetic suspension is definitely more of a performance suspension. It's not really meant for looks and fitment. But thankfully, because Magnaride is an add-on, it's something that can be used with coils or with leaf springs or with lowering bolts or with drop spindles. So you can just lower your vehicle height or adjust your vehicle height via those mods instead and then put Magnaride as a matter of fact. And that concludes this video for Noob's Guide to Suspension. This is probably one of the longest videos I've ever made for Noob's Guide series, but that's because I wanted to be rather thorough for it. If you enjoyed this series or you enjoy automotive content, make sure to subscribe and like this video and make sure to check out my playlist and my other videos as well. I'll link them here at the end. Other than that, thank you for watching and see y'all next time. Blade Angel out.